State University. This video is intended for those students who have not only just begun the horn but have begun their further journey on the horn and are ready to take those next steps. Maybe you've played for a couple months, maybe it's been a whole year. We're going to review some of the basics of posture and embouchure and the essentials that you will need to keep going forward on your journey with the horn. So you've chosen the horn. It's first of all, a visually stunning instrument. The second thing is its versatility. The reason I love the horn so much when I first heard it as a middle schooler in a church was the sound. It can do anything. It can play in a concert band, a symphony. It can play movie music, my personal favorite video game music, and it can even do jazz. This instrument will constantly push you and challenge you and reward you. The first thing we have to do to get started on our journey with mastering this instrument to a greater degree is our air. Before we can understand how to use our air through the horn a little bit, we have to understand a couple aspects about the horn itself. It's got a couple quirks that are a little bit different than the other brass instruments. First is we play it with our left hand instead of the right hand. The second is the size of the mouthpiece. It's much smaller than that of, say, a tuba or even a trumpet. But the final thing, and the one that I think most beginners will start to appreciate more as they play the horn, is the length of the instrument itself, the length of the tubing. At any point in time, a brass instrument consists of three things. The first is a buzz. That's the sound that we produce to amplify through the instrument into our tone. The second is a length of tubing. The tubing could be short or it could be long, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the third and final thing every brass instrument needs is a bell to throw the sound out so that the audiences in the back can hear it. Every brass instrument is made of those three things, but the horn is unique in that the length of its tubing is very long. Now, every horn comes in different sizes and shapes, you'll see the configuration look roughly the same while the inside of the tubing can vary. This particular horn in my hands, you will notice, is what's called a double horn. It means there's a set of tubing on the back and then a set of slides on the top. This is where we get the double nature of the instrument. It also has a thumb valve that we can use to switch between the two sets. Some of you at home may have what's called a single horn. It essentially has only one set of slides in the middle and a thumb hook where the place of the trigger valve would be. When we're blowing through the instrument, especially a double horn, we have lengths of tubing that we need to take into consideration. The first thing we have is the F horn or the bigger slides, the ones on the top. If we unwind these into one straight line, we'll get 12 feet of tubing. The back side, the B flat horn or the smaller slides, will unwind to equal about nine feet. That's the same length as a B flat trumpet. So when we're unrolling the entire instrument plus this big body, what we end up is somewhere a little over 20 feet of tubing that we're blowing through at any point in time. If you wanna think about 20 feet in terms of something familiar, you can think maybe the height of a, a giraffe, a fully grown giraffe or your horn. That's how far our air needs to travel when we're playing this instrument. Now that we better understand the quirks of the instrument, it's time to build a greater appreciation for our air, and that starts with the breath. One of the great things about air is the fuel of our instrument is also free. So sit up tall in your chair, straight back, straight feet, flat on the floor. We're going to inhale down through our lungs, which reach somewhere to the top of our collarbone, down to the bottom of our rib cage. I like to think of it kind of like a balloon expanding in all directions as I take a breath. Ready? Notice that the breath had a lower pitch quality. We want to avoid the higher pitch tense breath because our throat can create a lot of resistance and tension in the air, which will equal that tension in the sound, which we'll talk about in a later segment on tone. So one more time with a feeling of yawning in the back, a nice open breath.
One of my favorite sayings about the horn is that the only difference between a good player and a great one is their ability to fill it up halfway versus all the way. So we're going to practice doing that with our good breath. We won't make a sound just yet, so no buzzing. We'll take our good breath and we're going to visualize our air moving all the way through the horn in a really soft motion, like this. I like to envision the air going just past the mouthpiece all the way through the lead pipe and down and out the bell through the entire instrument. Now that we've set the standard for where our air should be moving, it's time to make a sound. Before we talk about tone, here's a quick review of posture. One, we need to sit up straight in our chair, nice and tall, nice and seated into the seat with our feet flat on the floor, about shoulder width apart. Two, we pick up our horn, remembering not to grab by the delicate slides or the bell, and we bring it up to where the bell faces away from our body and the mouthpiece is naturally brought to the height of your lips. The golden rule is to always bring the horn to you. You don't go to the horn. What this means is no sideways, tilting up, and definitely don't point the bell towards your belly or the sound will never travel out into the air. Once we've got that, our left hand simply falls onto the thumb trigger or in some cases a hook valves one, two, and three for the fingers, and finally your pinky curls gently into the pinky ring. The right hand is just a little bit more tricky and special for horn players. First, I imagine a princess wave. You can also think of catching a bit of raindrop. Essentially, you want the fingers and thumbs together and a slight curvature to the hand. Once we have this established, we can make a little bit of a platform here where the horn will rest on the thumb and the forefinger. This brace, located right here on your horn, is a good indication for where the hand should place. I like to think of the top of my hand sliding just to the right of that brace, curving in naturally like this. Making a good sound on the horn comes from the buzz. Our air is going to fuel our buzz, but it's the buzz itself that vibrates through the instrument. So remember the point of this video is to only review those aspects of embouchure, not truly begin them. So let's review the three crucial aspects that we should all have. Number one is a nice flat chin. Number two is firm corners with a nice puckered center in the middle of our lips to vibrate. And three is a two thirds, one third distribution of two thirds upper lip in the mouthpiece to one third lower lip in the mouthpiece. This will look like this. There are a couple of ways to start developing your own ideal sound on the horn. The first one is to immerse yourself in the sound of the instrument. You have to know what it sounds like if you would like to create that sound on your own. In order to do this, you can listen to professional recordings, live performances, teachers performing, or you can look up videos on things like YouTube or Spotify. So once we know what the horn sounds like, it's time for us to sit down and start making that sound ourselves. The ideal sound of the horn is beautiful, resonant, and open. It hits that place of warmth somewhere just between a trombone and a trumpet that we want to find the balance of. If we add too much tension to our sound, we get something like this. On the other hand, if we're too relaxed, maybe air escapes out the side of the mouthpiece, we'll get something like this. Good tone is all about good balance. Our lips need to vibrate freely. Our air needs to flow between them freely and our embouchure needs to hold everything together. One crucial aspect to becoming a better, more developed horn player is to develop your articulation. The articulation unlocks a variety of different musical sounds that you can create as a developing musician, but it also will greatly increase your chances of being an accurate horn player. 
The first thing to note is that it's not the tongue's job when we articulate to create the note. The note is created by a placement of air and embouchure, nothing else. For example, I can play one note using no tongue at all. Some may call this a breath attack, but it's a good indication that the articulation is there only to decorate the note, not to create it. Think of it like a cake. The cake is already baked, it's moist and it's delicious and ready to eat, but you want to put some icing on it, add that extra little touch of sweetness and design. That's your articulation. When we add the tongue, remember that it lightly sits with your teeth and the roof of your mouth somewhere right behind the crevice. The top of the tip of the tongue moves down. Two. I say two, some say T. Whichever articulation you prefer, make sure it's clear and precise. One exercise that I like to use to practice this concept of articulation decorating the notes and the tongue releasing on the airstream is very simple. Essentially, I will play one note, the first one, with a breath attack, meaning no articulation at all. The following note will add a light articulation, and then the third note will also add a light articulation. The goal is that the embouchure and air set up the sound first, and the tongue only acts as that slight bit of emphasis. Notice how in the exercise, the mouthpiece came completely off in between each note. This helps us practice the coordination of the many muscles that it takes to take in a breath through our body, set our embouchure, set our tongue, and then play. The best way to do this is practice, practice, practice. Please try this exercise on your own. The final component of this video will be to start developing your range. The horn has a massive range, somewhere between four octaves. It can go very low and very high. Think the range of the low tubas up to the range of the high trumpet. For this reason, it's important that you expand both of your aspects of range, the high and low, a little bit day by day. When we talk about range on the horn, it's helpful to go back all the way to our ancestors. No, not the original conch shell that people used to blow through, but the natural horn. In other words, we had a hunting horn that was used, just one loop of tubing and a bell. There were no valves, so you can imagine all of this being out in the middle. In order to produce notes, we were limited to those that didn't include the valves. We call this the harmonic series. Knowing the harmonic series really helps develop the range. We go back to the roots of the air and the embouchure moving naturally through the tubing in order to take us up and down the register. For that reason, it's my favorite place to start when we're looking to expand our range. Here is one simple exercise that you can start doing daily. It doesn't include any valves, so it's pretty easy to learn. starts small with three notes that you should already know and love C E and G the next version starts to expand us a little more naturally up higher into the range still we don't need any valves <laughs> to have more mastery over our sound through the register without using the valves, we can start hearing, does the sound stay smooth and connected or does it break? A break in the sound generally means a break in the air or a break in the buzz. We want to try to fix those in this smaller middle register first, so that way when we develop our low register and our high register, we'll have a higher chance of success. If you keep working on the harmonic series, you'll find that the possibilities can be almost infinite 
advanced exercises look something like this. The continued development and respect page to the way your air moves through the tube will make developing your range much faster and easier in the long run. It will also protect your lips by establishing the healthy approach to the extreme registers. This concludes our video on the next steps for the continuing hornist. We started with some basic review of beginner material such as embouchure setup and posture, and we're going to move forward with some of the tips to help you keep developing on your instrument and keep growing as a horn player. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me with the email address provided at the end of the video. Otherwise, happy practicing.